This is a complicated video and will cause a lot of controversy. However, this doesn't mean we're going to shy away from it. Please watch the video until the end before interjecting with any comments. I'm sure we'll come across some of the same old cliches. I'll try to demystify and contextualize many different topics often rumored to be true, even though they really are not. Maybe you've acquired many prejudices and you're looking to confirm a bias contradicting the video's title. But maybe, if you watch this until the end, you may change your mind. Let's start in 2005. La Agencia Oficial de Argentina issued this in a press release. With the arrival of the conquistadores began an extermination that devastated 90 million inhabitants of the region and broke the cultural development on this side of the Atlantic, the greatest genocide in history. These same words were written by the president of Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, stating, of the 90 million indigenous people who lived in the Americas toward the end of the 15th century, all were wiped out except for 3 million in 200 years. Hugo Chavez also started a campaign against Hispanic heritage by changing Hispanic heritage Day to the day of resistance and tearing down statues of Columbus for genocide. What is a genocide? A genocide is the systematic and deliberate, this is important, extermination or elimination of a human group for reasons of race, ethnicity, politics, religion, or nationality, a definition that fits with the crimes and persecutions against the Armenian people by the Ottoman Empire after the First World War. It also fits with Adolf Hitler's final solution primarily against the Jewish, or the genocide against the Aborigines of Tasmania by British settlers in the early 19th century. According to this definition, the Spaniards did not commit any genocide in America. Wait, wait, I'll explain it to you. Even though the phrase, the Spanish committed a genocide, is constantly repeated, this declaration is lacking factual truth, either on purpose or due to ignorance. Some people must be wondering, how is it lacking factual truth, given there were 90 million dead Native Americans? Sorry to disappoint, but that figure is false. To begin, you must make a calculation of how many people actually existed throughout the American continents when the Spaniards arrived in 1492. It's complicated given the different studies and conclusions. There are those who speak of 2 million, there are those who speak of 5, but the most rigorous figures were given by Venezuelan philologists who study the subject. Angel Rosenblatt, La Población Indígena y el Mestizaje en América, the Indigenous Population and the Miscegenation in America. According to Rosenblatt, the Indigenous Population in America before 1492 was about 13 million inhabitants, representing 100% of the population. Definitely not 90 million like Hugo Chavez had declared, but let's continue with Rosenblatt by 1570, almost 80 years later, the indigenous population had shrunk to 11 million and only made up 96% of the population. The remaining 4% of course were Spanish and mestizos. 80 years later, in 1650, the indigenous population was at 80%. By 1940, the indigenous population reached 6%. However, we see that this 6% consists of 16 million. That means there are more indigenous people than there were at the arrival of the Spaniards. By referring strictly to indigenous people were excluding mestizos. The Hispanic American population is mainly mestizo. Mestizo population. Let's check out the following. The percentage of mestizo population that exists today in some countries. Mestizaje. According to the World Factbook, an annual publication of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency with basic almanac-like information about various countries of the world, the data says that the mestizo and indigenous population in Peru right now is 85%. In Bolivia, it's 88%. In Mexico, it's 90%. In Ecuador, 92%. And in Honduras, we reach up to 97%. Now let's compare these figures of Spanish imperialism with those from English or French colonialism. In Canada, we have a percentage of Native Americans of only 4.4%. In the US, there are 0.92% Native Americans and 2.9% mestizos. The mestizo populations are notably so low because the predatory colonialism of the French and the English was very reluctant to mixing with the local population. When possible, they exterminated them. And when they did not, they were placed in reservations. As Herbert Eugene Bolton said, in the English colonies, the only good Indians were the dead Indians. Spanish Imperial Actions 
Miscegenation, mestizaje in Latin America, or better articulated, in Hispanic America, is not an accidental matter, but a clear outcome from the action of the Spanish Empire. Spanish imperial expansion carried out an inclusive characteristic. There was no destruction of cultures. At most, it was a process of acculturation. Destruction and acculturation need to be differentiated. The objective was mestizaje, miscegenation, and evangelization, not extermination and differentiation. The objective of the Spanish crown was not to establish mere factories to extract resources in the American continents, as the British had tried. The main objective of the Spaniards was to implant in those lands all their religious and technological and cultural knowledge, livestock, agriculture, music, language, urbanism, art, industry, technology, customs and festivals. The miscegenation was not only biological, but also cultural, and enriching cultural transfer back and forth. For example, you only need to see the beautiful Baroque facades of the Hispano colonial churches with with those wonderful pre-Columbian motifs. The Spanish Empire, in this sense, and as the philosopher Gustavo Bueno said, was a generating empire, unlike the English Empire that has been defined as a predatory empire. Also, as Pedro Insua, disciple of Gustavo Bueno, points out, in 1492, España contra sus fantasmas, almost all the conquistadores had natural mestizo children, starting with Hernán Cortés, the racial condition not being an obstacle to social promotion and advancement. Pedro Insua, the Spaniards never committed violence in the name of race, as affirmed by Gregorio Marañón. However, even with Rosenblatt's figures, we find a very large reduction in areas such as the Antilles in the early years. And why? Due to the brutality of the Spaniards? It's absurd to deny cases of brutality. But atrocities did not produce a demographic catastrophe. But then why the decline? It's due to processes of conquest and acculturation. But above all, and this is the main cause, the diseases carried by the Spaniards. For example, a smallpox epidemic that broke out in Santo Domingo between 1518 and 1519 wiped out practically the entire local population. Diseases. For genocide to exist, it had to have had occurred deliberately. The Spanish had no intention of systematically and deliberately annihilating a population. Have you ever asked yourself, if they wanted to annihilate the population, who would have worked in the fields and in the mines? The accusations are quite contradictory. It doesn't hold. Diseases were to blame for the great mortality that occurred in America in those early years. The population decline set in motion upon contact with pathogens carried by Europeans. Native Americans were not prepared for these pathogens. Diseases like smallpox caused serious damage and caused a multitude of deaths. Did the Spaniards know that they carried these diseases, or did they deliberately carry them? No. Diseases were extremely concerning for everyone at that time. In the early 19th century, Spain organized the first major humanitarian expedition in history known as the Royal Philanthropic Vaccine Expedition, or the Balmis Expedition by the name of the doctor who was in command of the trip. This great endeavor successfully took the smallpox vaccine to all corners of the empire by transporting the strains in orphan children who were the real heroes of the expedition. The inventor of the smallpox vaccine himself, the English physician Edward Jenner, said about the expedition, I don't imagine the annals of history furnish an example of philanthropy so noble so extensive as this. The laws. The legislation strove to ensure the free status of the indigenous people as human and to ensure their protection. Maria Elvira Roca Barea stated, the only laws for the protection of indigenous populations that had been in America are the laws that the Spaniards wrote, Maria Elvira Roca Barea, and also adds, the indigenous populations of the Americas were left without legal protection when the empire was dismembered. When the Catholic monarchs received Christopher Columbus after his first voyage, he brought with him several Native Americans. His intent the intention was for them to learn their language and enslave them, but Queen Isabel la Católica would end up releasing them. In 1503, the bringing of Native Americans to Castile was authorized, provided that this action was voluntary and without coercion. The indiscriminate slavery of Native Americans was totally forbidden. Another very common mistake is to think that in the Americas, the Spanish Inquisition forced the indigenous people to convert against their will. Another myth that is not true, the Catholic monarchs had received the mission from the Pope to evangelize those territories. Once the king and queen were made aware of Columbus's methods, he was charged with torture and tyranny, 
They took away his power to govern, imprisoned him, and returned him back to Spain. From this moment on, the monarchs would pay close attention to the conquest of the new lands and the treatment of the Native Americans, as Queen Isabel stated in her will, and had already expressed on many other occasions. Do not permit, nor cause, that the Indian neighbors and inhabitants in said lands and in the mainland that has been obtained or to be obtained receive any injury to their persons and to their assets. Instead, I command that they be well and justly treated. Testament of Queen Isabel la Católica. Fernando el Católico, already widowed from Isabel, then promulgated the laws of Burgos in 1512 to ensure the protection of the indigenous. However, everything at first was somewhat chaotic since the control of the crown in the distant lands was not effective, which caused abuses by some Spanish newcomers to the continent. Despite this, the disposition of the crown and of a large part of the councillors and jurors was to find the best way to administer those lands. His successor, Carlos I, assumed the policies that his grandparents initiated in the Indies during this time of great transformation and change. Theologians and jurists began to have important conversations about the way in which the conquest was being carried out. The deputies, led by the priest Ginés de Sepúlveda, took the theories of Aristotle regarding the conquests of new territories, who stated that as a progressed civilization, the Spaniards should govern and protect the indigenous people until reaching their full potential. The theologians came together with the ideas from the school of Salamanca, represented by the theories of another priest, Francisco Vitoria the Dominican. To speak of Francisco de Vitoria is to speak of the origin of what today are human rights. The rights proclaimed by the school of Salamanca were not based on consensual norms or divinized reason, but derived from the very nature of the person considered worthy by the mere fact of existing. Even though this idea had already been blueprint by St. Thomas Aquinas. This natural right is what these theologians pushed for upon the discovery of the New World. Charles I of Spain, 5th of Germany, listened to these wise men who intended to extend the empire in a legal and adequate way by combining the rights of the indigenous people to live in their lands and benefit from them, along with Spaniards who could arrive and do the same. In addition, this had to be done while collaborating with the Pope's mandate to evangelize the locals. Early on, evangelization meant something different to different people. Some tried to do so through what was called the requirement, that is to require them to convert, and if they resisted, then forcing them to do so. Many on the other hand, like Vitoria, promulgated an evangelization through conviction where the indigenous understood and freely accepted the Christian faith. Thanks to this evangelization, it resulted in the Spanish learning customs and languages of the local people, so much so that important grammars of the native languages were published during this time that have served for their conservation today. The encomiendas, however, were always an obstacle that were costly to solve. This ancient institution had been around since the Roman Empire and during the Middle Ages established a relationship between a strong individual who protected and cared for weaker individuals who would repay in fidelity in a type of guardianship. To prevent abuses that encomiendas provoked, the laws of Burgos dictated the guidelines to make them fairer. However, However, it didn't progress much. In the new laws of 1542, these encomiendas were suppressed and with these orders came new viceroys to the Americas. These mandates provoked a great revolt by the encomenderos. Among them was the brother of Francisco Pizarro, Gonzalo Pizarro, who was beheaded by the way. The opposing positions met in the Junta de Valladolid, convened by Carlos I to try to establish the conquest's main objective. The most powerful man on earth stopped a conquest to settle a matter of vital importance. If what they were doing was right or wrong, try and think of any other time in human history that something like this had happened. Arguing against Sepúlveda's position was the Dominican Bartolomé de las Casas, who collected the theories of the school of Salamanca and the late Francisco de Vitoria. The latter argued that the Native Americans had the right to be free, to the legitimate defense of life, to the means that guarantee their existence, to the freedom of property, worship, education, to the upbringing and education of their children, and even to participate in the government. All of this can be found in the Relectio de Indies, which are compilations of the ideas of Francisco de Vitoria.
You can read in Empires of the Atlantic World by the renowned British historian Sir John Eliot the following sentence, both the call for the Valladolid discussion and the legislation that followed are testimony to the Crown's commitment to guarantee justice for their populations of indigenous subjects, an endeavor for which, due to its constancy and vigor, it's not easy to find parallels in the history of other colonial empires. Sir John Eliot. Given this revelation, it can be said that international law and human rights are not an invention of bourgeois revolutions or the UN. No, it was the Spanish who, challenged by such a large discovery and task, embodied these rights and were the first to apply them at a universal level. This attitude of weighing out the options from an empire is surprising to see, an attitude that sought not to violate the natural dignity of the human being, because at the end of the day human rights are not guaranteed by the arbitrariness of power, nor needs of the economy. This was very clear to Francisco de Vitoria, who, consulted by King Carlos I, answered, Sovereignty has its limits, and those limits are primarily the natural rights of the individuals. Francisco de Vitoria. Justice in the Indies was applied in the same way as it was in the old Iberian Peninsula. Abuses and outrages existed, of course, but they were denounced, and mechanisms were put in place to correct them. The legislative production was set out to protect the indigenous and to take them as free men. This is very important. In truth, the laws of the Indies protected the indigenous and created a space through which an effective denunciation of injustices and mistreatment could be made. In fact, the indigenous people denounced with courage, since their status as subjects of the crown allowed it, as well as any other citizen. And no, 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 no. These laws were not a dead letter, as is often distorted. The chronicles are plagued by cases of encomenderos and high royal officials who were investigated, imprisoned, taken to Spain, and even executed. Bartolomé de las Casas was a Dominican friar who accompanied Columbus on his second trip. He had his own encomienda and was not the first to denounce cases of abuse. But from one day to the next, he liquidated his encomienda and devoted himself to the extreme defense of the indigenous people. He wrote the very brief account of the destruction of the Indies, a text of exaggerated rhetoric and very exaggerated and even contradictory figures. Las Casas stretched the hyperbole to the maximum and even defamation. No wonder this book was a gift to the enemies of Spain. The German Protestants, the Dutch, the English, the French Huguenots paid maximum attention to it by exaggerating again its conclusions. Translations and reissues of the very brief account of the destruction of the Indies multiplied. It was edited again and again in French, in English, in Dutch, in German. The English translation was also accompanied by terrifying prints by Theodore de Bruyne. Native Americans dismembered, dogs eating their meat, children roasted, atrocious tortures. And, as you can imagine, these engravings by de Bruyne toured Europe and had overwhelming success, much more than the written word. But they conquered us. What was happening in the world at that time? Yes, of course. And there were wars and there were deaths in all of the conquests that have ever existed throughout the last millennia since man is man, war was invented. It's irresponsible to judge past events with our current mentality. That's why we're going to put on the glasses of the 15th and 16th century and look at what the world was like. To tell the historical events that occurred during the first years of the conquest in America as a specifically unique and localist occurrence is at least a somewhat pitiful revision, perhaps self-centered and victimist. If we look at history as a set of global events at the same time of the arrival of the Spaniards and Portuguese to America, there were also equally important episodes in Europe, in Asia, and in Africa. A century before the first Columbus trip, the Black Death had ravaged Europe, a pandemic that killed a third of the European population. A century later, there was the capture of Constantinople by the Turks in 1453, an event of vital importance that altered the geopolitical chessboard. At that time, a guy named Vlad Tepes, nicknamed the Impaler, did his own thing by skewering thousands of Turks as if they were a Moorish kebab. On the other hand, the Catholic monarchs, before financing the discovery, ended the capture of Granada in 1492. The long 
long-awaited reconquest, restoring in some way what centuries ago had been Regnum Gotharum. War of Naples broke out afterward between Spain and France with important battles such as the Battle of Seminara. In the Battle of Serignola of 1503, firearms were used for the first time that ripped apart flesh. A few years later, the Turks defeated the Mamluks and appropriated Egypt and Arabia. The Islamic Sanjay Empire dominated West Africa for most of the century, expanding its influence until fratricidal fighting weakened it, being conquered by fierce mercenaries. When Charles I arrived in Spain, he had to put down great revolts in his communities. The Spanish monarchy and the Holy Roman Empire defeated France at the Battle of Pavia in 1525. The following year, the Ottoman Empire defeated Hungary in the Battle of Mohawks, where King Louis II of Hungary himself died. At that time, also the pirate Redbeard feared throughout the Mediterranean devastated the south of France and conquered Algiers and Tunisia. It was a miracle at the time not to see Moors on the coast. Tens of thousands of Christian Europeans were captured by Beberisco pirates in ship raids to enslave them. The Portuguese had also began trading African slaves. The sack of Rome by the emperor's troops took place in 1527. Twenty years later, Ivan IV of Russia, the famous Ivan the Terrible, the one who killed his son probably in a fit of anger, was the first Tsar in the history of Russia after a civil war that ended in multiple murders, massacres and fires in Moscow that destroyed entire districts. The Russians were spreading eastward. During the siege of Kazan of 1552, tens of thousands of deaths occurred. In India, the Mughal Empire was conquering its enemies one by one and ruled India for two centuries with an iron fist. In 1571, a battle of epic proportions took place, the naval battle of Lepanto between the Holy League and the Ottoman Empire. The greatest occasion that the past centuries have seen nor expected to see for those to come, Miguel de Cervantes. The following year saw the massacre of St. Bartolomé within the bloody European wars of religion after the eruption of Protestantism. About 3,000 Huguenots were killed in a single night. Thousands more were killed in the following days. On the other hand, the Spaniards were still very worried with the Anglo-Spanish War. And in the Pacific, battles broke out with pirates and samurai in the Cagayan Philippines. However, the expensive and endless war of Flanders resulted in much blood with military campaigns. At the end of the 16th century, the Japanese invaded Korea. Well, as we can see, the world at that time was violent and cruel, and many things happened. However, we aren't continuously proclaiming genocide, genocide, genocide. And we only mentioned a few historical occurrences here. There were many more, but it's impossible to count them all. The Spanish Empire was too busy with a wide range of items to solely focus on the affairs of the New World. Issues were left in the hands of private interests, and the news communicated between the two continents was very slow back and forth, especially when considering that Many messages spoke only of small skirmishes between a handful of Spaniards in an unknown, lost, distant jungle or place, places that didn't have great political relevance at least during the first years of the conquest, according to their known cultural order. Let's return to a trap that us Hispanics foolishly place ourselves in by enunciating this section, and they conquered us. A Hispanic American may say, they conquered us. Okay, but who? The Spaniards. Okay, but the Spaniards of today? No. The grandparents of today's Spaniards? The grandparents of the grandparents of the grandparents were really bad and genocidal? Well, I'm sorry to tell you, that's not the case. The grandparents of the grandparents of the Spaniards of today probably stayed in the peninsula and never traveled to the Americas. Then tell me, are modern-day Spaniards really to blame? Here's a story that's pretty funny. One time in Mexico, a Mexican journalist asked Arturo Pérez Reverte if he had no remorse for being Spanish and genocidal. You came to America to rape women and destroy our civilization, he argued. Pérez Reverte was thoughtful and asked what his last name was. And this guy replied, Sanchez. Reverte then told the journalist, The writer, I imagine, trying not to show a smile, explained, Okay, my grandparents never left to the Americas. Apparently, the one who did was your grandfather, that Mr. Sanchez. 
was happening before the arrival of Christopher Columbus? When Hernán Cortés arrived in the fascinating city of Tenochtitlan with 400 people, he encountered a tyranny that demanded as an annual tribute thousands of souls to be sacrificed. Bishop Sumarraga wrote in a letter stating that 20,000 people died a year in the capital alone. In addition, all the testimonies of the time affirmed that massive human sacrifices existed. And guess what? We found archaeological evidence. Human sacrifices were not exclusive to the Mexica Empire. Other indigenous tribes who did not reach the civilizational level of the Mexicas also practiced ritual sacrifices of children, such as the chichas of the current area of Venezuela and Colombia. And further south, we find the Incan Empire. The Incans did not usually practice sacrifices, but there are recent archaeological studies that indicate that it did happen on occasions and also with certain frequency. In addition, many of these Native Americans practice cannibalism. These practices debunk the myth of the noble savage, a theory suggesting that pre-Columbian Native Americans used to live in a kind of happy Arcadia. Far from it. Given all of this, the Spanish were stunned by what was witnessed. And another thing, how could a handful of people put the great Mexica Empire in check? Well, because the conquest, as they say, was accomplished by indigenous people. Overthrowing Montezuma would not have been possible without the Tlaxcalan allies and the Totonacs and other tributary peoples of Tenochtitlan who allied themselves with Cortés. Cortés was a great diplomat and of course a great general, and it must be said that most of the natives saw with great relief the end of the Mexica domination. Even if it doesn't feel right, for many Native Americans, Cortés was a liberator. I wish the English had conquered us. What do you mean, I wish the English had conquered us? Okay, right, right, okay, okay, okay. But then if your ancestors had been conquered by the English, they would have been annihilated. And you wouldn't have existed. Or perhaps you would have existed, but as someone else? Because we all know how the English got rid of the Native Americans. But this whole confusion of, I wish we had been conquered by others, is quite common and for good reason. The United States and Canada are now much richer than Hispanic American countries. But is this attributable to the Spaniards? Well, look, I'm sorry to tell you, no. When most of the Hispanic American countries achieved independence at the beginning of the 19th century, their cities were much, much richer richer, more prosperous, and much better equipped than the American cities that had been in the English colonies. The economic decline of the Spanish-speaking countries began around the 1830s and not before. The reason why today the North is much richer than the South is because the English-speaking colonies never grew into a classical empire. There never existed an English empire in the Americas like that of the Spanish Empire due to several causes collapsed. When empires collapse, they go through a long stage of stability and disunity. The Argentine Hispanist Patricio Lón says, let's return to the sense of common greatness that we once had. We're the same people, artificially divided into 20 states. United, we were strong. Patricio Lons, the historian and defender of Native Americans, Charles Loomis, at the end of the 19th century wrote this, which further demonstrates very well how there never really was an English empire in America, given the English arrived late and their projects failed. Spain explored after discovering the Americas in just over 100 years of relentless exploration and conquest, had managed to take root and was civilizing. Spain had built hundreds of cities in the New World, whose ends were more than 5,000 miles miles away with all advantages of civilization then known, and two cities in what is now the United States. Spain explored areas ranging among 20 of these states. France had carried out a few cautious expeditions that produced no fruit, and Portugal had founded a few towns of little importance in South America. England had remained throughout the century in great inaction. And between Cape Horn and the North Pole, there was not a single bad English casuca, nor a single son of England. Charles F. Loomis. The English Mayflower escapees reached the Americas in 1620 and founded a colony. Little by little, the English would be setting their course by the time of the rebellion of the 13 colonies. Philadelphia had 28,000 inhabitants, Boston had 17,000, Mexico in 1800 had 140,000 inhabitants, and Lima, Bogotá, and Havana exceeded 100,000. We already mentioned that the English colonialism had been defined as a predatory empire that chose not to mix with the local population. The natives were pushed away, killed, 
and expelled beyond the Mississippi River. The interests of the English in America were commercial. Colonies were declared as their possessions to exploit them without establishing any administrative structure. But as Borja Cardeluz explains, director of the Civilización Hispánica, Spain brought an entire state structure, named their new territories provinces, and created a complex administrative structure like vice royalties, governances, headquarters, town councils, constructed cities, villages, roads, monuments, bridges were built. They founded churches, hospitals, universities, missions. They brought over settlers, friars, soldiers, civil servants, engineers. In short, it's the last empire according to the classical model, Borja Cardeluz. The English speakers, however, appropriated the lands of the natives in a systematic way. Native Americans held no place in their plans, meaning they were seen as too many. They were also excluded on the grounds of race and considered inferior. The Spaniards, however, as we've already seen, did give rights to the indigenous through legislation. They protected their lands, also ensuring that these sovereignties increased and that these Native Americans cultivated them. Final conclusion. The Spaniards who arrived in the Americas allied themselves with most natives and waged war. Yes, abuses were committed. Nothing unusual for the time. In fact, it's not very rare for the world in which we live today that still has its injustices and its cruelties, given it's not a perfect world. The commitment of the Spanish crown cannot be denied, given these monarchs sought to establish rule designated to give protection to the natives and build a mestizo legacy, because all these things, I think, are worthy of admiration, and this legacy did not die with the emancipation within Hispanic America. This legacy endures and is called La Hispanidad, Hispanic heritage, and I think it's everyone's responsibility to protect and preserve that heritage. Let's create bridges and not walls between both sides of the Atlantic, because we're siblings and together we're stronger. I know that some of you are going to troll me in the comments, but please try and use serious arguments. Also, don't leave quotes by people like Eduardo Galeano, given that this writer has openly denied what he had written in his book. Las Venas Abiertas de América Latina. The Uruguayan writer even confessed that he would never read his most successful book ever again. These are Galeano's own words, El País. I would not be able to read it again. I would faint. For me, that perspective of the traditional left is very boring. My physique would not stand it. I would be admitted to the hospital, and he also confessed that when he wrote it, he hadn't enough training for such an enormous task. Thank you for watching, and until next time.